Hello, everyone. Uh, it's uh, Ed Pence, Executive Director of Crossref here, and uh, welcome uh, to uh, to this uh, to this session. Uh, so uh, we've we've got uh, uh, three 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 different sessions coming up uh, <clears throat> over the next uh, next ninety minutes. But uh, I just wanted to remind people that in the uh, bottom of your screen, uh, there's a green button that says the uh, uh, code of conduct. So please take a look at that if you haven't joined other sessions before. Um, uh, there's also the ask a question uh, uh, area where you can uh, where you can uh, ask a question. And um, yeah, and then other than that, uh, I hope everybody enjoys uh, the talks and um, uh, and gets a lot of information out of this. So I think without further ado, we can start with our first session. You can't put an ankle bracelet on ideas, or can you? And uh, joining us are Kath Burton, uh, Matt Cannon, and Daniel Daniel Fisher. So I will uh, hand over the, to them to uh, get started. Thank you very much, Ed, and hello to everybody. I hope you're all doing okay in this 24-hour pit party moment that we find ourselves in. Um, we're all first time Pitapaloozers. Um, we're excited to be here and we're yeah, looking forward to, to chatting as much as we can with you today. I hope you're all doing really well. Um, as Ed noted, I'm Kath Burton. I am an emerging PID fan person working in the Humanities Journal Division at Routledge, Taylor and Francis. Um, and I am, I am joined today by my two bandmates, um, Matt and Daniel, who will introduce themselves in a minute. Um, we really help, hope that what we've got planned for today will work out. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about a project that we've been working on to define challenges and opportunities for publishing and publicly engaged scholarship in the humanities. Um, and then we're really hoping that we can ask for some input from the PID crowd gathered here on our rudimentary publication pathway that we've been creating for public humanities scholars. Um, thanks to Ed for posting the link to the map in the chat when we get a minute. Um, to everybody that's here, feel free to, to annotate. We've created something, as I said, a rudimentary pathway in Lucid Spark, um, which you should be able to, to access and add your own um, annotations to. Um, but feel free to also send us comments in the chat now and after the session if you prefer. Um, we'll, let, we'll aim to try and wrangle as much as we can today and answer any questions you have about the project. So as I said, we're just starting out on our public humanities and publication journey. We're keen to know how we might make that a little bit more piddy. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Daniel to talk us through some of the background. Should I introduce myself? Should we introduce ourselves? Sure. So um, we'll do that bit first. So hi, I'm Matt Cannon. I'm the Head of Open Research for Taylor & Francis. Um, it's really nice to see some familiar faces in the audience for the first time at Pedapalooza. Um, so my role at Taylor & Francis is about setting open science, open research policies and finding ways to put them into practice on our journals with the aim of making research more transparent, reproducible and impactful. And I'm Daniel Fisher. I'm an assistant professor at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati and a research affiliate of the National Humanities Alliance in Washington, D.C. I'm a scholar of religion and a scholar of community engagement uh, in the humanities. Uh, and uh, to get things started, I wanted to share a bit about the scope of the challenge that we're addressing. So increasingly across America and really around the world, the humanity scholars are conducting their research with, in partnership with, and for communities. Uh, the National Humanities Alliance's Humanities for All initiative, which can be found at humanitiesforall.org, uh, documents over 1,850 of these projects uh, from the United States alone. Um, it's an open corpus, so if there's something that you know of, you can contribute it. Um, and this work, uh, publicly engaged humanities work, is often done in partnership with communities. Um, you know, it's mutually beneficial. It advances both disciplinary knowledge, you know, the knowledge of history, the knowledge of philosophy, the knowledge of religious studies, and public good. So it serves the communities and the scholars. Um, to give a brief hypothetical example, imagine a public history course, an oral history course at an urban serving university that is sending classes and faculty into a community in a changing neighborhood. 
to document their experiences, to amplify their voices, and to perhaps turn the tide. Um, this project, this hypothetical project, could lead to research outputs that include a zine, uh, a podcast, uh, a website, an online archive, a museum exhibition, a popular book, an academic book, or a journal article. Um, so this work is possible only in partnership with community members and institutions. It's driven by partnership and in part as a result, the research outputs it produces are pretty diverse, but as the field grows, there's a real need to publish in an academic fora on and about this work. Um, Routledge and NHA gathered some examples in the 2019 Publishing and Public Humanities collection. Um, this work is critical. It's also very challenging for reasons that uh, Kath can, can reflect on. Thank you, Daniel. Um, yeah, so through the course of the project, we've been talking to scholars and touching on the diverse ideas, activities and outcomes associated with publicly engaged humanity scholarship that Daniel was just describing. It's often the case that these are not traditionally captured in publications like books and journals that is often part of a scholar's um, academic life. It's also true that engaged work involves a wider range of academic and public partners, and perhaps some more messy processes and steps and diverse outputs that contribute to a project's success and longevity. Um, and that's how we, well, Daniel really, came up with the, the, the title for today's session. Um, as it's not all parts of the public and publicly engaged humanities projects that are well served by traditional publications in the humanities, those process steps that I was just describing, partner collaborations, values, and that messiness um, that we might get into in the course of engaged research. So we were wondering how we might go about changing that in a way that means the integrity of what matters to engage scholars persists, but ideas and conversations in the humanities are also free to roam and create anew, while also capturing and connecting all of the good stuff that humanities researchers, practitioners, and their public partners and more do. And that often goes underserved and under-recognized in current structures and systems. Matt. Okay, so now for the challenge that we're gonna to look to start to unpick over the next 15 minutes or so. So we're looking at solutions to try and track, surface and measure some of the different elements of the humanities research process as Kath has been talking about. Our idea is that kind of building out from some of the journal article publishing workflows and processes that we can start to use open science principles and PIDs to record and recognize the different activities that public humanities researchers undertake. And Daniel and Kath have given you some examples of those already. So hopefully, well, we shared the link to this map in advance um, and the link is in the chat. Um, and so this is the kind of a map that we've put together um, and we'll share it on the screen in a second um, to kind of try to map out some of these things, start to record some of the different actions and motivations of a researcher, starting to think about questions like, what do I want to publish? What do I want to say? How will I publish it? And things like that. So what we want to do is invite you either to um, dive into the map um, directly, and you can follow the link to do that, or um, we're sharing it on the screen so you'll be able to see, um, see what's there. And the two things that we're going to be asking you to, to think about are firstly, where there may be links between points on this map, i.e. is there a metadata link between two of these things? Um, secondly, adding points where we know PIDs exist to um, record these activities or outputs. Um, and in addition, there may be things that we want to record where PIDs don't exist. Um, and we may want to start highlighting some of those as well. Um, yeah, if, as, um, as we've mentioned, um, there may be issues with registration, but if you don't want to set up an account or you're having access, feel free to just uh, shout out ideas in the chat and we'll also be recording these and we can use them as uh, jumping off points for discussion as well. If you're already in the map, you can see we've already flagged some points where DOIs um, as a PID are used in this process, um, but also some other PIDs like ORCID and we know there's others that um, are used as well. We've also I started to identify some things that public humanities researchers already do um, and are preserving um, so or may want to preserve um, so feel free to flag some of these already you can see we've kind of pre-made some record this 
um, kind of bubbles, which you should be able to pick up and move around and drop on to different elements of the chart. Also, um, there's some peer to bubbles as well that you could pick up and move. Feel free to edit these to um, be more specific about the, the PID that you found. Um, so, yes, hopefully that should get people started. We've also got some prompts that we can, um, that we all kind of pop into the chat um, and also talk about to, to kind of get things moving. Yeah, thanks for the host for flagging that, that this is the link that's just gone in the chat that you shouldn't need to log in to be able to access. So if we kick off with the first prompt. What facets of work do we want to um, identify? So obviously, as we've said, people are working in different ways on some of these public humanities projects. And actually, there may be different parts of that process that we want to um, identify so we can measure and record it. So to bring to life some of the facets of publicly engaged work, Daniel, I wonder whether you might sort of talk a little bit about some of the projects that we've been discussing in the course of our working group and, and maybe from the scholars' perspective, some of the um, items that are contained in Humanities for All, for instance. Yes, absolutely. Um... Intriguing as it is to see everybody dotting around on the map and wanting to dive in to see where, where everybody's going to annotate. Yes, yes, of course. So the hypothetical project that I, I mentioned was based on a project out of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, a series of courses called Baltimore Traces that all um, sort of send students in partnership with community members out into the world to uh, do oral history interviews, to, uh, to get to know communities, um, to, uh, to learn about their histories and their, their contexts, and to produce media, um, to produce podcasts, to produce zines. In 2017, the class went uh, to Lexington Market. I don't know if anybody, is anyone in, uh, in this room from Baltimore or know Baltimore? Lexington Market is a historic market um, that uh, you know serves. Uh, it has, for since its real, really since its inception, served immigrant communities, and uh, it's a it's a great market, but it's not a fancy market. Um, and the city created a plan to update it to. Um, to make it a bit fancier, but that would alienate the constituency of the market. So the classes went on a number of days to the market in partnership with market management and conducted interviews. And they identified two problems. One, community members, members of the market community didn't really know about the plans, what the details of the plans to redevelop their market were. Um, and two, um, the redevelopment well, everyone agreed the market could use a coat of paint. Um, the redevelopment had, would have the effect of erasing really generations of engagement with the space and with the community. So they wanted to amplify some of those voices. Um, they went in, they conducted oral history interviews, they created a zine. You know, they thought about different models of reaching the community. Um, and, you know, the market community wasn't really going to necessarily download a podcast, but they were at the market and they could pick up a paper in Baltimore has a really well-developed zine culture. Um, and so they created a very elaborate zine. Um, and um, then they, they hosted an event um, and released a second zine. The first zine documented um, the the proposed changes and talked a bit about it. The second zine documented um, the, the voices and histories and communities of the market. And then they hosted a community event at the market and it was it was a festival. Um, the energy was not unlike Pitapalooza, um, but it was more, more local. Um, and uh, the courses have also been 
the subject of an academic article. I can't uh, off the top of my head remember the journal, but the method was laid out. The thing to remember about community engaged humanities scholarship is that often it's as much about process as anything else. Um, and that process isn't necessarily linear. Um, the process um, depends on all kinds of um, unknowable factors. Factors that can be known at the outset. A zine is a kind of, yeah, it, it's kind of like a magazine. But Are they kind of like a lo-fi magazine, like a more like a homemade sort of magazine? When I was growing up, they were, they, you know, they were black and white affairs created on, on photocopiers. Uh, now they're elaborate and, and rich computer technology is, they look more like magazines than they did before. And often subcultures um, have them. The yeah, I was thinking of more of them as like music, fanzine, like stuff that goes with like local music scenes in cities and stuff. Yeah. If you go to humanitiesforall.org later, um, there's a copy of one of the zines on the, and there's a profile of Baltimore Traces where you can learn more. The Baltimore Traces is a great example of a community engaged humanities project. And uh, it's, it's a course, it's a research initiative, it's for the public good. And it's also advancing knowledge of communities and, and raising voices of communities that aren't often included in in historical scholarship or at least aren't as much as they they should be and i think that's what we were trying to do through the course of this project was to identify some more of those parts of the research process that aren't necessarily captured in traditional publications so we tried to create this map to um articulate in, in map form um, what some of the, the steps on the pathway towards publishing, if you're doing publicly engaged research, might be. Um, and we were finding that there's, there's lots of overlap with some of the ways in which traditional um, publishing infrastructures are conceived um, and created. But actually, there's, there's quite a lot of stuff that's missing. You know, so how do we get that messiness into the publications that already exist? Do we need a different publication type? Or can we perhaps try and identify some of the, the work that's being done by using some of the existing metadata systems that we have. So that's kind of the thing that we're trying to, to un, unpick and annotate here in, in the course of the map. So I wonder, Matt, whether there's a, an extra prompt that we can pop in here whilst people are, are still engaging with the map. And I try and find the Baltimore traces to share with everyone, Daniel. Yeah, I was just um, thinking about that. So yeah, it's great to see how many potential PIDs have been mapped already. I was just having a look at the map myself and uh, lots of uh, people recognizing PIDs and adding all of those, which is fantastic. Um, I think wonder whether one of the other things that it might be really good is um, that people want to consider things that are on this map that maybe should be recorded that maybe currently aren't um, and where we might want to have PIDs or um, see gaps for recording things and having them persistently identified that don't exist already. Um, so yeah, some of the things that have the, the red spots in the map. Um, yeah, I'll pop that in the chat. Maybe just to bring this this part of our, our question and prompt to to life as well. During the course of the project, um, uh, we've been we've been really looking into that that concept of process, um, which might seem um, a little anachronistic or out of place for for humanities researchers, um, but actually it became a really integral part to to the conversation. Um, and it isn't something that is much exposed in the work that's being published um, for engaged humanities scholars or humanities scholars at, at large. So. There was something that we thought was really, really useful there. You know, how or how would you go about designing a project if you wanted to work with the public? If you wanted to, um, to Daniel's point, do some work that had a, had a greater good um, to address some impact and the real world challenges um, that your research might be um, also interrogating. And that really got us into thinking about, well, there's sometimes more of a traditional linear process. You know, we have an idea, we do the work, the thing comes out at the end and we, we write about it. 
Um, but actually, there's lots of two steps forward, one step back kind of activity that goes on when you're doing engaged research that's really valuable to share around. Um, so how do we actually do that in a way that's not overbearing, that's not um, getting in the way of the good stuff that's being found and the work that, you know, the effective work that's being done in communities? Um, and it was that that got, got us into to that process um, conversation a bit more deeply um, and started to consider whether you know, it's useful to share what did and didn't work um, in the course of the research project. The process really shapes the outcomes um, and the journey of that process is necessary for understanding the outcomes and for reproducing well, you can't reproduce publicly engaged humanities work necessarily, but you can draw on it, you can build on it. And as the field grows, the methodologies simply need to be discussed. Um, yeah, and we were thinking also a bit about how some of the open science principles could help um, and kind of be weaved in with some of these ideas to help as well. And we, in preparing this, we talked a bit about kind of maybe recording things in different ways like recording a calendar of activities that obviously you could share online with a PID, for example. Um, and that might be an interesting way to record these things and provide a record or an archive of what happened and what went well and what didn't. So yeah, also thinking about some different mechanisms that we could use to try and capture some of this work to help, not with reproducibility, but help others with future projects. Yeah, and some things are, are elusive in the Baltimore Traces example that I shared. Um, you know, the community event at the market was a, a moment where knowledge was gathered and shared and, and appreciated. Um, and, and it no doubt fed into further research on it. But how do you, how do you record that? Um, do you need to write it up and submit it somewhere? Yeah, and I think mm -hmm. no, and I, that, that kind of gets us into the last two really interrogative questions that we, we hope we might be able to pose here, not necessarily hoping for all um, complete answers today, but this is the start of a conversation we think about how we might expose some more of that process in the course of publication. Um, so I'm going to post just two last questions into to our chat today, and maybe we can come back to these during the course of other conversations. After, after Pitapalooza, we've got a dedicated space now for our publicly engaged humanities and publication work on H Commons. Um, we can share the link to that in due course as well. Um, but we were really thinking about what existing publishing structures need to do to support more of the aspirations um, for publication that public humanities scholars um, and practitioners have. And thinking again about the way in which um, uh, we might start to draw in a broader range of stakeholders into the conversation who can help publicly engage publication practices more effective, whether those are in the existing evaluation systems, whether they're in library or digital publishing systems um, that we're all getting involved within. Um, how can we sort of round out that conversation so that we can make our publications a little bit more effective and useful for publicly engaged scholars in the humanities? So yeah, I guess we, we, we think about that. Sorry. Sorry. Please. I was just gonna say, like, feel free to just put ideas in the chat. Um, we also we need to think about the community members that are equal partners in in this work. Um, you know, most don't have work uh, for reasons that are understandable. It, it doesn't necessarily serve them. They're not publishing. Um, there are different are objectives. Yeah. Sorry, Daniel, it's a bit of a delay. Didn't mean to talk over you. But yeah, the, those different kinds of objectives for the, for um, academics and scholars alike, and some of the more public partners. Um, there's a there's a shared there's a shared value. There's a shared interest in in wanting to make a difference. But actually, there are perhaps slightly different um, slightly different modes of um, communication. There are slightly different modes of um, dissemination in terms of speed and, and audience. So I think there are lots of things that we're trying to, to align through the course of this project. Um, so this is this is really helpful to see how people are interacting with the, the map actually because it will really give us a, some more food for thought as we go as we go forward and try to try to create some solutions.
Thank you, Janet. <laughs> great, thanks. Hi, Ed said back again. I think we're just coming up on time. This has been great. Thank you very much. I mean, a lot of really, really good information. And I think uh, I put in a chat where uh, we can have follow up uh, Q and A on on the Slack channel. And I see, yeah, you've posted the uh, uh, a, a couple of links there. Uh, and I think, um, yeah, there's some really important questions. I mean, from from my perspective with Crossref, <clears throat> you know, look look looking at the publisher publishing structures, and you think what what gets actually added into um, uh, uh, the metadata for publications, you know, it's, it's, it, do it doesn't address all those, all, a lot of the points you made. So I, th I think there's a, uh, it's a really rich area to, to explore how a lot more of this could be, uh, uh, captured. Um, yeah. So yes, thank you. Th uh, thank you very much. And, uh, yes, we will, uh, yeah, have the discussion over on Slack and, uh, well, thanks very much. And we will, uh, uh, have a, a minute or so break while we uh, move over to uh, uh, the next uh, speakers. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, thank you. thanks. Thank you. Thanks for everyone. Bye.